I'm not a prophet. I've said that over and over again. I'm one of many, many watchmen. My message this morning, the towers have fallen, but we've missed the message. Uh, Lord, you have to help me, and you have to speak. We have got to hear from heaven. We can't hear from men, not even from me or any other watchman. We pray, Lord, not our words, but the words that come from the throne and from your holy book. Now, Lord, monitor every word and that every word come with mercy and let it come with grace. But, oh, Lord, there's a message that you're trying to deliver to this nation and the world, and we dare not miss it. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, Understanding the Times with Jan Markell a program committed to helping you contend for the faith and view current events through the lens of the Bible. Here's Jan Martin. Welcome to the program, the program that looks at news, views, and truths from a decidedly biblical perspective. You heard some words from Pastor David Wilkerson back on uh, September 16th, 2001, That might tell you that that might be the sort of the theme as we move along in this particular hour. And let me ask this, is it possible that there exists an ancient mystery that holds the secret of America's future? That this mystery lies behind everything from 9-11 to the collapse of the global economy, the American economy? that ancient harbingers of judgment are now manifesting in America? Or is this stretching scripture and coming to a vain conclusion? I don't believe so. Now, there's going to be a very key verse in our discussion, and that's going to be Isaiah 9.10, and it reads, The bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. The sycamore have been cut down but we will plant cedar in their place. What is a harbinger? Because this particular program, we're going to be discussing the book, The Harbinger. What is it? It is a foreshadowing. It is an omen. It is, or a herald, of warning of good or bad. In other words, you see a robin, it's a harbinger of spring, okay? In, in my neck of the woods, that's a good harbinger when you see a robin. And ancient Israel received nine harbingers of warning, Now, America has harbingers appearing, says my guest, Jonathan Kahn. And what are some of those harbingers? Well, we will get into them. At least we will get into discussing a few of them. We have the incident 9-11 itself. We have the prophecy that was proclaimed to the world, spoken from Capitol Hill. The day after 9-11, we have uh, the stone of judgment that was placed on ground zero, the ancient mystery that affected uh, your savings, your bank account, your financial future, etc. We have the sign of the sycamore and the prophetic revelation it contains concerning Wall Street, another harbinger, the mystery of the Erez tree. Another one is the day that a vice presidential candidate, Jonathan Edwards, uttered the ancient proclamation of judgment on America. We have the mystery at the ground of America's founding and the prophetic message it contains for this hour. In other words, there's a lot of intricacy here in the scenario that we are about to lay out in whatever time it takes to do that properly. And I'm very happy to have on air with me Messianic Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. Uh, Messianic Rabbi Jonathan Kahn is senior pastor and rabbi at the uh, Jerusalem Center, Beth Israel in Wayne, New Jersey. He's president of Hope of the World Ministries. And the book he has authored right after he did author it, it soared to at the top positions on a number of outlets, including New York Times. Uh, Jonathan Kahn, welcome to Understanding the Times Radio. Hi, Jen. Great to be here. You know, I don't know quite where to start, Jonathan. I have lived with the story, and, and it is a novel, folks. I've lived with this story for about about a week, and I've been reading, I've been watching it, and I actually... World Net Daily and Joseph Farah produced, I believe it's a two-hour film, but there's a lot on the internet you can watch, and the book's available in just about any bookstore. Jonathan, uh, The Mystery of the Harbinger, give us an overview, because uh, interviewers like myself literally get overwhelmed with all the detail. Okay, yeah, and, and just a note, it's the, the form is a narrative, as you said, but mm-hmm. the really 90% of it is nonfiction. That's is right. The, you know, are these mysteries. In a nutshell, it is that 
God works through patterns and God is consistent and with the judgment of nations or the warnings of nations. And the harbinger is, as you, you, you touched on at the beginning, is an ancient mystery, goes back over two and a half thousand years and lying behind what's happening now. And again, starting from, from 9-11, continuing right now, touching everything from the economy to the politics, everything. And it is the mystery that involves the last days of ancient Israel. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is that in, in the last days of the Northern Kingdom, and this is the 8th century BC, there appeared nine harbingers identified in the book that are these warnings of judgment or signs of a nation that is departed from God, in defiance of God, and God is warning them and calling them back. But these appear as a warning of judgment. And the eerie thing is that the these same nine harbingers are now reappearing on American soil. The the harbingers which warn of a nation in danger of judgment and destruction. And you know it, it begins with you know Israel, ancient Israel was founded to be a nation after God's word and his his purposes. They turn away from him. They get, they get into sexual immorality. They defy every you know his law. They they persecute his people. They offer up their children in sacrifice. He sends prophets to them again and again. But it, what happens, they, they completely defy it all. So finally, he allows the first thing to happen. And this is the first harbinger. And, that, and it's a pattern in Scripture. It's not only with ancient Israel. It happens with Judah as well. And that is before the nation's destruction, mm-hmm. years before, there is the, the hedge of protection around the nation is removed. It's a temporary removal, enough to allow a strike, an enemy to make a strike into the land. So, so there comes this strike. It's by the Assyrians. And traumatizes the nation. But then it's over and it's a wake-up call and it you know then the nation's going to have it's going to have a period of years to ha- really hang in the balance it's going to come back to god or it's going to reject god and what happens with israel instead of coming back instead of repenting what happens is that they they defy god they become even more defiant and they make a vow and that's the that's what yeah. you, you spoke of at the beginning and that's the key to really unlock the harbingers it's isaiah 9 10 and they say to god basically and to man they say well the bricks have fallen in this attack but we will rebuild with hewn stone. The sycamores have been cut down in this strike, but we will plant mm-hmm. cedars in their place. So in other words, what they're saying is, God, you're not going to humble us. We're not going to turn back. We're not going to change our course. We're going to, in fact, we're going to go even farther against you, and we're going to do it with more strength. We're yeah. going to come back stronger against you than before. This is an ominous thing. It sets the course of the judgment of Israel. And then, and within a certain period of time, years later, you know, one calamity follows the next. They, they don't wait. They keep on rejecting God's warning. It keeps, more keeps coming until finally they are wiped off the face of the earth. They yeah. became more defiant, uh, Jonathan. Actually, they were driven. That's when they, they were scattered. They became the ten lost tribes of Israel. Who knows exactly. where they went? <laughs> I mean, they turned up in all sorts of places. Just for uh, just a little um, by the way here, and that is your, your ministry and your Messianic congregation headquarters, not far from this location, than the Ground Zero. Your wife was supposed to be at Ground Zero that day, mm-hmm. and you yeah. had others who actually, from your congregation, yeah. who were in the building, they're okay. Yeah. And as I'm reading everything and watching the films, the question that I think will come to any reader's mind is because once they get overwhelmed with all the details, and there are, there are the details are, are profuse, folks, but in the end, they all make total sense. So don't let that sound like this is too complicated to follow. That's not true. But how did this come to you? How did this piece by piece, Harbinger 1, 2, 3, 4, and you can't give us the pattern with each and every one, but how on earth were you suddenly standing? You were suddenly standing yeah. there at ground zero, and what yeah. happened? Yeah, well, well, right after, you know, after 9-11, I was praying, and I was led to this, the general section of scripture which which in, which details this warning strike in the na- in the nation's history and I wasn't looking for the an- I mean for what that was that's just what came what came I was I was led there I found out later you you know you played a clip at the beginning that David Wilkerson you know around the same time shared to Times Square his his congregation there that the same passage the same scripture and he didn't do it because he saw the harbingers or saw all the stuff much of that came after he did it just from a complete completely mm-hmm. independently mm-hmm. He just got this that this was the thing and then so that was on my heart and then year and then a, a little while a while later I'm sta- I'm standing at the corner of ground zero I'm actually engaged in a project that had to do with you know with this whole thing but I see an object and the object is a, the, the sycamore mm-hmm. and that's and something just says you know just there's something there go search mm-hmm. uncover 
And so I, I start doing that, and I'm immediately led to Isaiah 9:10. And as I go, everything in Isaiah 9:10, the next puzzle piece unfolds. The next puzzle mm-hmm. piece, um, mm-hmm. each harbinger starts unfolding. I'm still seeing everything in there is unfolding, and it appeared and it happened. I mean, when it happened, I didn't realize it, but now I'm discovering each thing was fulfilled. And then, you know, I didn't know this as I'm being led through this thing. I press a button on the internet, and and instead of getting Isaiah 9:10, the scripture, it goes to the congressional record of, a, of the United States, and only then do I discover mm-hmm. that the very scripture was proclaimed, the very vow was proclaimed the day after 9-11, you know, and, and not by just one leader, but by more than one. So I was led immediately to Isaiah 9-10 and watching everything before I even knew that this was actually the proclamation of America in, in view of 9-11. As I shared it mm-hmm. at Israel, you know, the congregation, you know, people were basically kind of gasping, saying, mm-hmm. this word has to get out. And later, I, you know, I was led to start writing a book. While that happened, the economy collapsed, and there were things in the Harbinger initially that actually related to that. So then came a whole second kind of stream of mysteries that until the whole thing came together. But I, I was as much blown mm-hmm. away as anybody. Well, I have a couple of those clips, and I'd like I'd like to play them. The first one came from Senator Tom Daschle, and that was the day after 9-11. It is with pain, sorrow, anger, and resolve that I stand before this Senate, a symbol for 212 years of the strength of our democracy, and say that America will emerge from this tragedy as we have emerged from all adversity, united and strong. Nothing. Nothing can replace the losses of those that have suffered. I know that there is only the smallest measure of inspiration that can be taken from this devastation. But there is a passage in the Bible from Isaiah that I think speaks to all of us at times like this. The bricks have fallen down but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled. Okay, I kind of interrupted you, and we can play uh, vice presidential candidate John Edwards a little bit later, but I interrupted you. So the thing is that that here it is that, that, you know, each one, the the, the ultimate thing is that this mystery, this ancient mystery of of a nation's judgment Mm -hmm. or warning as it heads to judgment, happens progressively. It's so specific, Mm -hmm. I mean, that it actually determines or foreshadows or, or speaks of the the actions of American leaders, the words that come out of their mouth, you know, even to exact days, like to the, to, you know, ancient mysteries from the Bible that, that speak to the exact days when the stock market crashes, or even down to the hours. So it's, it's a, an exact progression. Mm-hmm. And there, so there are nine harbingers that are identified. And I mean, of course, we don't have time to go through, go through them all, but I can ju- that are in the book, but I could just touch yep. a little bit on some of them. And we're, we're heading to, you know, that one you just played, was, which, again, was an ominous thing that I had no idea of when, when this started. For instance, one of them in the book is called the Gazit Stone, or the Stone of Judgment. And it goes right down the vow of Isaiah, and where, where Isaiah quotes their defiance. And what happens is, after this first strike, the people of Israel, they clear away the bricks that had fallen, and they go to the mountains of Israel. And the, we know that because the Hebrew says Gazit Stone. It, it's translated hewn stone. It means literally a quarried out stone, a cut stone from mountain rock. These were the massive rectangular blocks of stone um, that, were, that were used to build you know, mighty buildings. And so what happens is they take the stone, they quarry it out of the rocks, they bring it back to the ground of destruction, where, and they lay it down where the bricks have fallen. And that's where they say the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn or quarried or gazit stone. They lay it in place there. It becomes the beginning of their vow to rebuild their nation stronger than ever, but against God. And so this becomes the beginning. So what would this have to do with America? Well, this is the book, it is the fifth harbinger, and that is that, that after 9-11, in, there's a mountain in New York, the people go up to that mountain, they quarry out a massive 
rectangular block of stone. It's 20 tons of stone. It's a biblical gazit stone. They bring it to New York City, as would have to be for this harbinger. They bring it to ground zero. They lower it onto the pavement of ground zero where the bricks had fallen. And they literally have a ceremony around the stone with American leaders. I mean, this is the thing. Just like ancient Israel, the leaders were involved again and again with the harbingers. American leaders are involved. The governor of New York and New Jersey, the mayor, and they're all gathered around, and they pronounce vows of defiance over the stone, saying this is going to be the beginning of us coming back stronger than ever. We're going to rise stronger than ever in defiance. They actually use the word defiance. And when you look at the, the commentaries on this, on Isaiah 9:10, they talk about how, how all this Israel was doing everything in a spirit of defiance. The governor of New York actually uses that phrase. He says, we're doing this in the spirit of defiance. And they have no idea what yeah. they're doing. And I want to just you know, yeah. make that clear, that it's not that anybody's trying to fulfill this or make this happen, but it's happening. It just keeps manifesting one after the other. And you go down Isaiah, like, it's, like, it's like line by line. The, next, the ancient vow, it says, the sycamores have been cut down. And that was that, what it meant was that in that strike, uh, that initial strike of warning when the Assyrians came in, they didn't just strike the cities, they struck the land. And the sign was that the, the trees were, were felled, and particularly it says the sycamore tree. In the Bible, those who, who are students of the Bible know that, you know, the, the sign of a cut-down tree is used again and again in the Bible as a sign of judgment and national judgment, and particularly the sycamore here. And so what could this have to do with America? This is the sixth harbinger, or the sign of the sycamore. And, and the thing is that, you know, you wouldn't expect, you know, the place to look for trees and agriculture is not New York City, and the, the terrorists are not trying to do anything here having to do with the Bible. But here's what happens in eerie thing. In the last moments of 9-11, when the last tower comes down, it sends forth a shockwave, and it sends forth a beam of steel into the air, and it strikes an object that just happens to be there on that day on the corner of Ground Zero. That object happens to be a tree, and that tree happens to be the sycamore, the sign. And the sycamore has fallen. The sycamore is struck down. The people of New York make it into a symbol. They, that happens almost with all the harbingers. They, don't, they make it into a, this, this icon. They call it the sycamore of ground zero. They put it on display, and they have no idea that this is, this is not a good sign. This is a biblical sign, everything happening as in the last days of Israel. And then you, you look at Isaiah, and it goes, I mean, it's, it's eerie how it goes, because it says the sycamores have fallen, and they vow, but we will plant cedars in their place. And what this meant was, it's another act of defiance. And what Israel's saying is, listen, God, you think you could humble us? The sycamore is, you know, struck down. We, we're going to take a stronger tree, and we're going to plant it exactly where the sycamore stood. So we're going to do a tree for tree. We're going to put it right there to tell you that we are not going to be humbled. And like this thing, we're going to come back stronger, like the cedar, stronger than ever. Well, what could this have to do with America? And I, I also want to say that anybody can look at the commentaries on these things, and it'll, it'll go through exactly exact, you know, it's really, it matches exactly what happened in America. So what happens with America is that, first of all, this tree, you know, is, a, is what we call in English cedar. Of course, mm -hmm. they didn't speak English, they spoke Hebrew. And the tree is the Erez tree. And this is the seventh sign or seventh harbinger. The Erez tree can be a cedar, but it also it literally means, best translation is, it's a conifer or a pine tree, needles. It's, a, it's literally, the, the exact definition is panacea tree. A pine, the pine vine, which can be a cedar, but it means more than that, even in the Bible and in ancient you know, documents that we know. So what does it have to do with America? Well, this is what happens. About two years after 9-11, a tree appears in the sky at the corner of ground zero. It's being lowered by crane to, to go into an, a precise spot. It goes into the soil where the sycamore of ground zero had stood. So this is an act of replacement. In Isaiah, it's, in Hebrew, it's called halaf. It means you know, either to replace something or literally to plant with something in the place of another. So this is what they do. And what kind of tree is it? It wasn't a sycamore. It was a 
conifer tree, a panacea tree. It was the biblical Erez tree of Isaiah 9.10. In fact, it is the sister tree of the cedar of Lebanon. It, they put it right in, in the place of the sycamore. They have a ceremony around the tree, just like they did around the stone, and they, they call it the tree of hope, and they, they literally, in the ceremony, pronounce that this is what they're doing. They're replacing the sycamore with this. They have no idea that this is the exact steps of a, the biblical manifestation of judgment in a nation. So they do this, and I do want to also, again, make note, nobody was trying to, do, you know, put this together. Nobody could have been in charge or could have made happen that sycamore being struck down. And, and the people who, you know, the reason why they have that tree is because somebody happened just to have to donate it. And it was totally different people than did the ceremony around the stone. So it just keeps happening. And then it gets even more eerie or bizarre or exact, and that is leading to the actual vow itself, and that is that the day, and we, we just you know alluded to it, but here's the background of it. The vow is that, that after this strike happened in Israel, the leaders of Israel, they make this vow. It had to be the leaders as well as the people, because only the leaders can speak for the nation, only they can set the course. So they, they rise up with this vow, and they would have done it in Samaria. That's where they ruled from. That's the capital city. They would have been a public statement, and it would have set the course. And this is an ominous thing, because it's setting the course for the nation to judgment. So what could this have to do with America? What American leader in their right mind is going to pronounce a vow of judgment, you know, oh, and identify a nation under judgment? Well, th- it happens, and you played that, that clip, and at the time it happened, I mean, we were, you know, kind of, everybody was traumatized, they missed it, but what would have to happen for this harbinger is that an American leader would have to make this vow and pronounce this publicly from the capital city, and soon after the attack, for the first one, and speak of what set the course of the nation, it happens Tom Daschle, Senate Majority Leader. He's the one who's chosen on the day after 9-11 to give America's response. And it is in the capital city, and it is the, the official response, and at the end of his, his, you know, his response, of America's response, he puts in... That, that what you just heard, there is a word from Isaiah that I think speaks to mm-hmm. us at times like this. He has no idea what he's doing. He has no idea what it even means. He thinks it's an encouraging scripture. He has no idea that this is a scripture of judgment, and he pronounces it from Capitol Hill, and, and, and after saying it, the bricks have fallen, the whole thing, at the end says, this is what we will do. In other words, yeah. we will do Isaiah 9-10. And, and he, when he, you know, he speaks of the tree that struck down, he doesn't realize there is an actual tree that's just being discovered that day. He speaks of the stone that's going to go up. He doesn't know what's going to actually happen three years later. And he speaks of the act of replacing the one with the other. He doesn't realize it's happening. And people, you know, said that, well, how can someone speak like this? You know, he's not, this is, this is like prophetic words. He's not a prophet. And I said, well, look in the Bible, because you have the same exact phenomenon. You have Caiaphas, and I'm not saying anything about the man, Tom Daschle, personally, but you have Caiaphas, who it says that he said something, and he didn't mean it. He, he, he meant it in, in, he said, one man has to die for the people. He's speaking about murder, but the Bible said he was prophesying. And so, you know, he inadvertently speaks, it's like a double entendre, and that's exactly what happens with Tom Daschle. It says because of the office he had. Well, Tom Daschle represented the Senate, the Senate represents the nation, and so he speaks on the very day after 9-11, and he's going to set the course, and, the, and literally, this is exactly what America's going to do. It's going to seek to rise up in defiance, without repentance, without changing its course, just like ancient Israel repeats the same mistake. And what's going to happen is it's going to lead to another calamity, another shaking of America, the next warning of judgment. But it all happens, we didn't realize it, but it happened the very day after 9-11. Let me reset the stage here, because folks, you've joined me late. You may be wondering what on earth are you listening. It is Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line uh, Jonathan Kahn. He is the author of this uh, incredibly popular book known as The Harbinger, The Ancient Mystery That Holds the Secret of America's Future. And it uh, it's also a film. You can check that out at worldnetdaily.com. And there are some DVDs that Jonathan can provide you with. You can get that information at theharbingerwebsite.com, theharbingerwebsite.com. You can find more information about Olive Tree Ministries 
ministry that's hosting this program. That's olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. No, we don't carry the book at this time. We don't carry it at this time. That's why I'm giving you these other options. If you want to continue, uh, Jonathan, we have about four sure. minutes until we have a bottom sure. of the hour break. Sure. That, and the, yeah, they can get the Harbinger everywhere. I mean, we don't, yes. you know, we don't say it through us. Yeah. The other thing is, and <laughs> it wasn't only Tom Daschle. That's you right. know, three years after 9-11 and on the anniversary of 9-11, another American leader who's very prominent at that moment, he's a senator and he's running for vice presidency, and he comes to Washington and he, on the day of the anniversary of 9-11, the third anniversary, he gives this speech to the, this congressional caucus, and what he does is he opens up by saying, there's this word, and then out of his mouth comes the ancient vow of judgment, of defiance of Israel. He says, the bricks have fallen, and he goes through the whole thing, the sycamore, the cedar, the whole thing, and not only does he say it, but he builds his entire speech around mm-hmm. the vow. I mean, he makes the whole, the entire speech is Isaiah 9:10 as a speech. He goes on to say, "We're putting up the cedars, and we're putting up the stones, and where those sycamores fell." I mean, he thinks again that he's giving this encouraging word, and he thinks he's only speaking symbolically. He doesn't realize there is an actual sycamore. He doesn't realize there is an actual uh, erez tree. He doesn't realize the stone actually went up, and 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 he's linking it all to 9/11, which is the prophetic scenario, you know, because this is on the anniversary of 9-11. It all has to do with the strike that happened, and so he is also doing, he's linking America to ancient Israel. He's linking 9-11 to that warning strike of judgment with ancient Israel. He's linking America's attempt to defy 9-11, and this, this, hap- this touches everything, to what, to what happened with ancient Israel when they tried to defy God's warning without repentance, and they were destroyed. Let, yeah. let me just play a little bit of that clip, because sure. I think that these illustrations Help. Today, on this day of remembrance and mourning, we have the Lord's Word to get us through. The bricks have fallen, but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. This is taken from Isaiah, the ninth chapter, the tenth verse. And let me show you today how in fact we're building and putting cedars in those three hallowed places the footprints of the towers in New York the Pentagon and the field in Pennsylvania walk with me through this day and you'll see that this is in fact a season of hope walk with me through this day Jonathan these men are trying to be encouraging yes that's what's motivating them they're they're hardly thinking about judgment absolutely yeah, if they did, they would never have said it. I know. I mean, exactly. And and the same way, Caiaphas was speaking of murder, yet he spoke a prophecy of of the sacrifice. And that's the whole point. If if they had meant it, it would be, I don't think they would ever have said it. Uh, it could never have happened. The fact is, it could only be done by if they didn't mean it. That's the whole point. You know, they did, and, and it's kind of amazing that they didn't, you know, even look of a few verses before, mm-hmm. a few verses after. And remember, the the harbingers are not about, it's not about people trying to do it or knowing what they're doing. It's a sign, and it's not even about the people themselves. You know, there are people who said, listen, it's interesting, each one who said that fell afterwards. Well, it's um, true, they did. But it's not about them. Yeah. It's about the sign. Well, there there are a lot of other things that I think we need to talk about. Let me just throw in a couple of things, folks. Again, that book, you can get it in any bookstore, uh, The Harbinger, The Ancient Mystery That Holds the Secret of America's Future. Laurie Kutzler, as you were reading the book this past few days, uh, what were your thoughts? I didn't realize in my own life how far I've drifted. Mm. You know, it's easy to just go to church and do the the Christian Mm. things, but I I realized that in my own life there were a lot of idols and there were a lot of things about my lifestyle that may not have been exactly honoring to him or just departing from him just a little bit. And uh, I would like to ask Jonathan when we come back from a Mm -hmm. break, you know, just about judgment in itself, because if 
if people don't feel, the church or people in general, don't feel God judges anymore, then there's no need for yeah. repentance, and all these <laughs> harbingers really just kind of go over their heads. Folks, remember, this programming is posted to my website uh, shortly after you hear it on the radio. That's olivetreeviews.org, views as viewpoint. Go to radio. And uh, also, just a very quick reminder about Understanding the Times 2012, October 5th, 6th, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, White White House correspondent Bill Koenig and Dr. Erwin Lutzer. So we're going to be back this fall as we have for the last, I don't know, I guess since 2001. We had 8,000 in attendance last fall because, you know why? Because the times are troubling. So um, if you'd like to come out and learn how to understand the times and contend for the faith, October 5th, 6th, we're coming back after a short time out. We're going to continue with Messianic Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, the book The Harbinger, how you can get a hold of it, which is very easy. So... Don't go away. Don't touch that dial. Why did God allow the towers to fall and over 2,000 people died in the in the crash? Holy anger that arises in my heart when I hear preachers on radio or hear that they said on television, oh, God had nothing to do with it. God had nothing to do with it. Don't... Put it on God. Why don't you go to Daniel 9? And I want it once and for all tell you that this was God allowing America to be wakened. God didn't do it. He didn't stop the plans of the enemy because he had a greater purpose. Because there was love for America that was about to slip into everlasting hell. Understanding the Times continues. Here once again is Jan Markell. You are listening to well, this particular hour anyway, and probably we may go into a, an extended session online. We'll see. But we're dealing with the book The Harbinger, which is also a film. There's numerous uh, DVDs, various things online, but you can get an official DVD at theharbingerwebsite.com, theharbingerwebsite.com. I have with me online from the East Coast, Messianic Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, who is the author of that book. He heads a ministry, hopeoftheworld.org, hopeoftheworld.org. Jonathan, as I have listened to various interviews of you, you come under some criticism, which I feel is completely, at least what I have heard is unjustified, because you are not saying, please clarify, you are not saying that America and Israel are equal, are you? Not at all. Uh, you know, I'm Jewish, and, you know, God has his purposes to Israel, and mm -hmm. that's, that's absolute. The, it's uh, never replaced by, not by the church or any, any other entity. This, it's a very simple thing, and that is that God is consistent, and he is consistent in, his, in the way he deals with nations and in the warnings of nations, and there are patterns in the Bible, and in this case, it's, it's a pattern, but it's so specific that once you see it, it's kind of hard, it's, you know, it's just kind of beyond anything. So it is, it is the pattern of, of America turning from God. I mean, the one, you know, one striking thing is that, and I mentioned in the book, is that America was founded by the original founders to be set in the pattern of Israel. They said, let's, you know, we're going to be a new Israel. And it's interesting that it, America has been blessed, you know, more than any nation in the modern world. And so, in the sense that, and now, though, we're repeating Israel's mistake, um, ancient Israel, and so it's, it's kind of, it's fascinating that now the same exact pattern is, is happening in right. America. So in that sense, but there's only one Israel, and America's America and Israel's Israel. But the fact is, this pattern from the Bible, and by the way, we're told to apply the, you know, these, the patterns of the Bible, that, that the lessons and the truths of the Bible are to be applied. It says these were for our instruction. God is consistent, and, and it's the pattern that is, is now replaying, the mystery that's replaying mm -hmm. uh, to another nation. Larry Kutzler, as a pastor, my hunch is you would use illustrations out of the Old Testament on well, a regular... Absolutely. I think every Sunday school class, Jan, takes uh, Samson and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Daniel and the lion's den. These are all templates to learn spiritual lessons mm -hmm. that you build a spiritual principle from. Another question I have here before we move on, Jonathan, and that is a lot of listeners, because they follow a certain theology, happens to be my own theology, we kind of read into the narration for the last days, and we see America isn't there. I think a lot of listeners are thinking, 
and I don't want to get hyper negative here, and I don't want to say things are hopeless. I think the minute we start throwing out, there's no way America can turn around. When we start throwing those terms out, listeners tend to turn the radio off because it gets too overwhelmingly dark. So I believe we have to hold out hope. But the Bible, clearly, America does not play a significant end time role, and I know you're aware of that. Yes. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Jonathan, because we're all on the same page here, and I want this to get in on the, as I call it, the real radio audience. Then, before we go on with your outline, then where do you see America headed? We know that in biblical prophecy, clearly America is not mentioned specifically as the power that it is, and so what that means is that itself is significant. There has to be a change. Right now, we have a world that's still, you know, in the in a sense, the uh, the Pax Americana after this, the whole 20th century uh, pretty much has been America's age yes, of ruling, right. of head of nations. But, you know, but it's not there. So the interesting thing is the Harbinger, what it, see, what it appears to be here in this is that it's sort of filling in the gap between the two yes. scenarios, where we are now and where end-time prophecy takes us. So the Harbinger, like, how do we get where America is not where it is? Well, here, Harbinger is very specific yes. and very precise you know, and concerning America. And so to put that all together is this, you know, is there hope? Well, there's always hope for for people to to turn back to God. The point of the harbinger is a call. I don't believe, if there wasn't hope, I don't believe the harbinger would have come out. I don't believe I would have gotten this, and I don't believe it would have been for this time. So, but the thing is that does it look like America's turning back? No. Does it it look like, when you look at the culture, you turn on the television set, does it look like it? No. However, you know, there are other possibilities. There can be revival within the midst of it. There can be a turn to God from his people, and many other things that can happen. What does it look like? Well, you know, and we can get to it as we, as we go forward, but that there, if America as a nation doesn't turn back, it's going to, it's going to fall, in, and there are many ways that could take place. That, but that doesn't mean God's purpose is stop, and that doesn't mean that there can't be revival, and that doesn't mean that, that God's spirit doesn't move. Let's move to the mystery at the ground of America's founding, the mystery hidden at the ground of America's founding, because I think this is a very, very significant, I mean, out of all yeah. the places near ground yeah. zero yeah. that weren't destroyed, this is one of them. Yeah, the, the, there's a principle in the Bible and with with Israel, and that is that that the, the judgment or the calamity returns to the nation's ground of dedication, or, or where it was consecrated to God. And with Israel, it happened on the Temple Mount. It, when the Temple was finished, in a sense, the whole nation was finished. It was like the, the, de- it was the, it was the inaugural day where, where you had the Temple, you had the priesthood, you had everything together, and you had Solomon, King Solomon, calling the nation together at the Temple Mount, praying, dedicating everything to God, and he's praying for the future. He dedicates the future to God. He says, God, if they turn away from you and they you bring judgment you know they come back have mercy and he goes through all these scenarios so it's a prophetic day and a time so so what happens is that when judgment finally comes to Israel it's going to return to that very same spot to the temple mount where it was dedicated in covenant to God and so and that was a sign that God saying listen you've totally the covenant is broken and you on your part and you have you know and, and I'm calling you to return the message is return to the place where you've fallen from so what could this have to do with America? Well, interesting, there's a parallel. On America's first day as a nation, and it wasn't 1776, it was, it was April 30th, 1789, it was the first day that America had a, it was fully formed as a nation, had a, had a president over the government, first time everything in the Constitution was there, and it's, it's, so there was the inauguration of the first president, Washington, and it happens in the capital city. And it's also a day of prayer, dedication. They call for prayer all around the, all around the nation. And uh, Washington, when he is sworn in, he gives, in his first address, he gives a, a prophetic warning to America. And it, it is, we don't have time to go into the, the whole thing, but basically it's, it says in a nutshell that if America ever turns away from God, if a nation turns away from its principles, goes against these things, then the, the, the blessings of God or the favor of heaven is going to be removed from the land. And it's, it's actually, we're seeing this happen. We're seeing both things in our day. We're, ha- we're seeing America turn rapidly away from God, and we're watching the blessings being removed. So he gives this prophetic warning. It's embedded on the first day. Then he leads the first government of America to a place on foot, 
to dedicate America to God and to dedicate the new administration and the future, everything that's coming. They go to Little Stone Chapel. They spend about two hours there. They dedicate the future to God at that ground. If we can find out where that ground is, we've got a mystery, because this is the mystery ground of America. This is the consecration ground on its first day. So where was it? It was in the nation's capital. The capital... The first capital wasn't Washington. It wasn't Philadelphia. The first capital of America was New York City, where it was lower Manhattan. Where exactly? They go and they dedicate America to God at a particular ground. And that ground, the America's ground of consecration, America's dedication ground, is at ground zero. America was consecrated to God at ground zero, the ancient principle and mystery that the calamity returns to the nation's ground of dedication. In fact, it wasn't only that they prayed there at the corner of ground zero. Washington was there. Adams was there. They were all there dedicating America on the first day with that, with that prophetic warning in mind. And not only that, but ground zero itself was church land. It was actually owned by that church. It was all one thing. So it actually is the ground. And on that day, that's well, actually that's where the harbingers appear. Not only around there, but but actually the sycamore, the sixth harbinger, appear. It grows right out of the soil of America's consecration ground. The the act when they did this ceremony where they replaced the one tree with the other from Isaiah nine ten. It all happened on America's consecration ground. And on that day, a shock wave goes forth from ground zero, from the place of the dedication. And it, it strikes another place, which is, which is Federal Hall, which is the place where America began on that inauguration. And that's where Washington gave his prophetic warning that if America turns away from God, the, the blessing is going to be withdrawn. And it strikes that Federal Hall, and, it's, and it literally puts a crack in the foundation, which here's the foundation of America, and the foundation of that place is cracked from 9-11. But on, not, but on Ground Zero, you know, all, all the buildings around Ground Zero are destroyed or totally gone in one form or another, can't be inhabited except one. One is protected. They called it the miracle of September 11th. And that place was the stone chapel where America was mm-hmm. dedicated to God. And the reason why they said it was protected is because there was an object that absorbed the force of 9-11, and that object was the harbinger. It was the sycamore, the sixth harbinger. It absorbed it as it was struck down, which is Isaiah 9.10. So here you have something that that really brings it all home, not only literally home to the ground, but also that the message, the point of the harbingers is not that the nation be judged. The point is to to save a nation, to warn it, to wake it up. And that's the point, not only the harbingers and the warnings of God, but it's the point of the book. It's the point of the message going forth now. That's the whole point, that America, you know, that there can be hope, and God is calling a nation. If he, if he wasn't, there wouldn't be a book, and there wouldn't be this, this mystery. There wouldn't be any of it. And the other, the other thing with that, and we talked about this, Jan, when we were talking before, and that is that when Solomon dedicated Israel to God, it was at the Temple Mount, and after that, those days of dedication, God answered his prayer. And he, he says he spoke to him, and, he, and that's when he says this famous verse that people quote all the time. He said, well, if my people who mm-hmm. are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now that was to Israel, but the point, the principle here now is applied, even linked by the, the ground of dedication. It's all together, and that is the point here in the Harbinger, is that you can't, we can't just say, hey, America is, you know, is going down and this whole thing, or America is, is the problem. We are the light, and we are the salt. We, as his people, yes. we have to repent, as Larry was talking about before. It's a wake-up call. We have to be the lights. That's the point. It begins with us. Well, some there are some who are... T- uh, tuning your message out because they're saying, well, Second Chronicles 7, which you just quoted, if my people, that that simply cannot be applied to America in any way. So uh, I know you're aware of that. It's, it's like saying that anything in the Bible, because just about everything in the Bible yeah, is about Israel, can't be applied. I mean, and that's just not, not the case at all. It's one thing if, you're, if one is saying that this was written to America. No, but the, clearly this is, these, are, these are the words of God. Just like, you know, when he's, you know, people quote, you know, God says, I know the plans I have for you, and people say, well, some people say, well, you can't say, yeah, say that because that was, of course it was to <laughs> Israel. Israel. But it's the same, it's the same God. 
God. You know, I mean, it's the same God, and and the same the the principle in the Harbinger is simply this: that you, we can't just say it's America and not us. We are His people. It be whatever it begins with us. I mean, we can take it another way. It says judgment begins with the house of the Lord. Well, so also revival. Right, and, and Larry wants to weigh in too, but we we need to be careful because, and you know this, Jonathan Kahn, and Jonathan is my guest this hour, folks. If you've tuned in late, you're listening to Understanding the Times. I'm Jan Markell. We're talking about the Harbinger, and there are those who, I mean, they're very, very cautious. That God doesn't have a covenant with America. That's the thing that they're trying to get away from. He has a covenant with one nation. Well, I think that's the, the point, Jonathan. You brought it out. These are not judgments. They're warnings. But the overarching theology of the scripture that God wants none to perish. Yeah. Now, he doesn't yeah. care about the democracy so much as yeah. he does about the souls in the country and the nation that needs to come back to God. I want to play, Absolutely. Absolutely. Jonathan, I want to play a short clip here. It's very, very short um, sure. of uh, T.A. McMahon from Berean Call. Actually, this clip comes from my program, folks, a couple months ago. It's a rescue operation. Mm-hmm. We're not going to turn this thing around. This is like a flood. This is like a, a tide that you know, hasn't ebbed yet and won't ebb. But if we can rescue people in it, for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, those who are open to the truth. God said if you have not a love for the truth, he will send strong delusion that you believe the lie. So it's where our hearts and our attitudes are, and then we've got to back it up with some discipline of getting into the Word of God. T.A. McMahon is saying, Jonathan, that what we have in front of us is, is a rescue mission. And I think what he's emphasizing, and what a lot of listeners are emphasizing too, is shouldn't we be rescuing souls in America, for that matter, around the world? Should we even be focusing on saving America? Shouldn't we be strictly focusing on rescuing perishing souls? Well, a few things. First of all, the Harbinger is totally about rescuing, yes. rescue mission, and rescuing souls. In fact, you know, I think it's the second to last chapter is entirely a, an altar call to salvation. And yes. the effect is that people are getting saved. So, I mean, there's three things, and I would say the Harbinger. One is what it leads to. I mean, it's, on one hand, it's, you know, all these ancient mysteries, and it's a revelation of what's happening now, but, all, but it has a purpose, and that is to salvation for the lost, repentance for the saved, and, you know, and revival. You know how you know, and the thing is that so the ultimate call and the ultimate call in the in the harbinger is salvation. That's always first. At the same time, it should it be that you know we don't care that that I'm not saying this is what's said here, but we don't care that for instance you know millions of babies are being are being killed in the unborn. Well, that's also a, that's part of salvation too. That should we care if say we're we're living in a house with other believers and the house is burning on fire? Should we not try to put the fire out? I mean, or should we should we not try to to help. Well, the gospel is the beginning of everything and is everything, but it also does apply to other things, too. The key point, again, in the Harbinger is calling people again, and the, and the ultimate thing is it's leading up, whoever's reading it, it's leading up to salvation. And the ulti- even in the Harbinger, I mean, not just even, it says, listen, whatever happens to a nation, the ultimate thing is that we are all, we are all heading to a day of judgment. Yeah. You know, and, and so, so this is a wake-up call, and most people you know, in, in the nation are going to be looking at what's happening in their lives, mm-hmm. but it's ultimately leading to eternity. I want to add something here before our uh, radio audience uh, might leave us. And I just want to say a couple of paragraphs. And folks, I think we're going to continue our discussion online. This will be our kind of our web bonus for this particular month. And there you can just go to olivetreeviews.org and go to radio. I'll say more about that as we exit here in just a matter of minutes. But let me say that no matter where you are as a jury, when it comes to the information presented by Jonathan Kahn, the book, uh, the movie made by uh, Joseph Farah, which you can find out more at worldnetdaily.com. And the information shared on the program today, I think there's no question in anybody's mind that it is appropriate for believers in America to pray that the great nation, that this great nation would experience some kind of a turnaround, be it a spiritual turnaround, a moral reversal, a return to righteousness. I don't know what it's going to be, but I think the likelihood of that is probably small. But as we speak... I mean, all of us, we have seen, particularly the last few years, there are forces, and they're not just unseen forces, trying to literally dismantle this nation. They're trying to turn it into something most of us find to be shocking and abhorrent. And God didn't establish America 
to go the route of Venezuela and Cuba or China in spite of the uh, redistribute the wealth voices you're hearing today. No, we are not a chosen nation. Only Israel has that calling, but we have been God's favored nation to get the gospel out to the ends of the earth, to be a protector of his real chosen nation, and that is Israel. What other options does America have? Politics won't save us, okay? What other options does a watchman like Jonathan Kahn or myself have other than to warn? We don't want the blood on our hands. What you do with this information is up to you. You have been warned. America has been warned. As I said, I think we're going to continue our discussion on for our online listeners. Go to my website and then go to radio, and this will be uh, probably our only online bonus in this particular month. You can always order CDs of a favorite program, and you can become a CD subscriber, $15 a month to do that. And, uh, Jonathan, we've got a minute until yeah. we run out here, then we'll continue it, but go ahead. Sure. Sure, and we didn't just a note. You know, I mean, there's there's so much we did. Sort of like we touched on some of the things in the first part. Mm -hmm. In the second shaking, really, these things are behind everything that's happening now. That's right. People's pocketbook. I mean, to the mystery of Shemitah. You know, all that stuff. So maybe we can talk about that. But just to say, you know, thank you, Jan. It's a a blessing. If Pete will, I'll I'll be glad to continue. Uh, If people want to get, I mean, the book is everywhere, and if they want to get the full revelation, it's on, as you said, the HarbingerWebsite dot com, the HarbingerWebsite dot com or dot org. And the other one, the documentary they did is called the Isaiah nine ten Judgment, which Mm -hmm. is on Amazon. The Isaiah nine ten Judgment. So, and our ministry is Hope of the World dot org, Hope of the World dot org. But I appreciate it and be glad to continue. All right, folks. So if you'd like to join us for that web bonus, you can do so at any time. And again, Jonathan, I'm going to be bidding farewell here to my real radio audience. Again, I thank you for coming on. I thank you for uh, for honestly for stepping up to the plate in doing this. I just I was I'm faced with being overwhelmed when I look at the assignment you had and how you connected the dots and pieced it all together. I'm you know, I know that the skeptics will remain and that's okay. But if this is a message speaking to your hearts, folks, all I can say is pray for America. You know how I like to close this program. Many, many times I say, may God bless America, but he only will if America blesses God. And that is that is the point of this last hour and whatever we might do here in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. And it's all laid out in the book, The Harbinger. So I encourage you to look into it and check it out. Tuesday, September 11, 2001, the Twin Towers of New York City were destroyed. Now, to understand where God is in this calamity, you've got to absolutely believe in this book. You have to put everything in what God says in his book. And if you're ready to hear that, we'll begin to understand where God is in all of this. I can assure you God wasn't taken by surprise. Every ruler, every despot, every terrorist, God knows when he sits down, he rises, he knows where they're at. And very soon they're going to be in hell because God deals with them. Nothing on the face of the earth is done without his knowledge, without his permission, and even sometime by his doing. Okay, welcome back. This is sort of the web audio bonus for this particular month. We do this as uh, now and then when, you know what, when I end up with uh, too many notes and my guest isn't really finished, and I think that my audience really needs to hear a little bit more, and since we have an electronic following, that's what this is going to be for at least half hour or so. And again, this is uh, Jan Markell. Jonathan Kahn is on the line with me from the East Coast, and we're continuing our discussion, and uh, let me just reset the stage by saying that Jonathan has covered some of the harbingers that he outlines in his book, The Harbinger, and obviously the first 55 minutes, we didn't hit them all. We're going to hit a few more in the time that we have left here, and obviously 9-11 was the first shaking, and then there was a second shaking. We kind of want to head there as well, and Jonathan, if you'd like to start there, or if you'd rather do it in another location, I'm going to leave that up to you. Sure. Uh, yeah, and, there, there, and there's more harbingers from the first that we, we probably couldn't go through now. But the, the principle is that, and you'll see this in the commentaries, uh, like again and again and again, and it happened with ancient Israel, is that when the first warning or shaking came, this was this strike on the land, and the nation responds in defiance, rejects the warning. What, is it, what the commentaries say, and these are all the classical commentaries, mm-hmm. is it that because the first was rejected, there's going to come a second. There's going to come more, I mean, you know, because it's really in God's mercy, he's going to shake the nation. So 
here, the first one we have here as this strike, the, the pattern, the biblical template, that, the, that there's a strike on the land, temporary, and, that, and this with America is 9-11, that we saw the nine harbingers that come from that. One of the harbingers we, had, we saw was that on the day after 9-11, we have the Senate Majority Leader proclaiming the yes. ancient vow of judgment that links us all together. I mean, and it also contains all the harbingers. And he says it from Capitol Hill, we will rebuild, you know, the sycamore, the tree, all that stuff. He says the whole thing. And it's really, as Israel did in, in Israel's last days, rose up in this attack with a vow of defiance. So he says their actual vow of defiance on the day after 9-11. And the interesting thing is, years later is going to come a second shaking. And the second shaking is going not going to be a physical strike, but it's going to be a strike on America's power mm-hmm. itself. And that is that America's very superpower, which it's economic or financial superpower, is going to collapse. The economy is going to collapse. Wall Street is going to collapse. It's going to be the greatest economic disaster or collapse since the Great Depression. And the thing is that the day that triggered all this, and people don't realize this. The government, the American government, Federal Reserve, rushed to New York City, an emergency meeting with Wall Street in, the, in September 2008. And they made a decision, that they announced a decision that day, and they said, we're going to basically let this thing fall, this Lehman Brothers. We're going to let it fall. What happened through doing that, right or wrong, what happened is that action is going to trigger, a few days later, the entire collapse of the economy, the entire collapse of the, of the global economy, the American economy. And so what day did they do that? Well, interesting, the day that that fateful decision was made by the American government was the anniversary of the day that the ancient prophecy, Isaiah 9:10, was proclaimed from Capitol Hill the very day after 9-11 when America made that vow, the, the vow of America. We're going to come back stronger than ever. Uh, seven years to the day, to the day is, yes. is when this all mm-hmm. triggered the second shaking. And so you've got this thing, and, you know, the interesting thing, there's a pattern, there's a principle in Scripture, you can find it in the prophets, where God says, on the day of calamity or the day of judgment, I'm going to explain expose the foundation. I'm going to expose the nation's foundation. Well, what's the foundation of America's superpower, financial superpower? It goes back to New York City, to Wall Street, and it happens, it's laid in the, in the late 1700s when there's a secret meeting in New York City, and that's followed up by a signing of a covenant actually on Wall Street. It's the beginning of Wall Street as we know it. They sign a covenant. The covenant is called the Buttonwood Agreement. Mm-hmm. And that is, it's called that. It's, it's literally the beginning of Wall Street. In fact, Wall Street, the first name of Wall Street is Buttonwood. And they form the Buttonwood Association, which later is called the New York Stock Exchange. And what is this Buttonwood? Because this is the foundation of America's rise to the economic financial superpower. It's laid that day. What is this? What does it mean? Buttonwood is a tree. It was the tree under which they signed the covenant. And what kind of tree is it? Buttonwood is the sycamore, the sycamore tree. The foundation of America's rise to power, financial superpower, is the sycamore. The sign reappears on 9-11. We saw this in the first part when we did this on the show, as one of the harbingers. When the sycamore is struck down, the sign, not only the biblical sign of judgment, it's the sign of America's particular power, and it's struck down on 9-11, and actually, you know, what they do is they, they make a monument to this struck-down sycamore, and they, they make a, a, a bronze statue, and they put the statue, it's of an uprooted tree, and they put it, instead of putting it at ground zero, they put it on another street, they put it on the end of Wall Street. So it's right there, the, the very street that's named after the sycamore, the very power that's named after, is now they have an up, a sign of a sycamore uprooted. So if a you know, blooming sycamore is there on the day of America's rise. It represents here is the rise of America. What does a struck down yes. sycamore represent? You know, God says on the day, on that day, I will expose the foundation, and that which I have planted, I will uproot. You know, so here is you know, just and, and this is like kind of putting everything. You've got the harbinger, you've got Isaiah nine ten, and and you've got this thing that's a mystery to America, and then you have. You have another thing which is really mind-boggling, which is the mystery of the Shemitah in the book. That's what it's, that's what it's called. The Shemitah, people may not recognize that word, but many Bible students will know that Israel didn't just have a Sabbath day. It had a Sabbath year. Every seventh year, they had a rest. Every seventh year, they could all, you know, sowing and plowing and reaping came to a 
standstill. You couldn't buy or sell the produce of the land. It was kind of like an economic rest. And so this happened every seven years, and it was to be a blessing. Um, and on the last day of the Shemitah, last day of the year, was the finale, was the crescendo. And what happened is, on that day, which was the, uh, the 29th day of Elul, it's Elul 29, on that day, the last day of the Shemitah, all debts are wiped away, all credits wiped away, all basically the financial accounts that are linked to that are wiped away. And it was, again, supposed to be a blessing, a release. But the problem is that as America turned away from God, and as they, they rejected the Sabbath, rejected the Shemitah, and rejected God, and they put money ahead of God and idols ahead of God, what happened is the Shemitah, the Sabbath year, turns from a blessing into a judgment. And when Israel is taken into captivity, what's going to happen is the, the Bible reveals that they're in captivity for the exact number of Shemitahs, or Sabbath years, that they didn't observe. So it becomes a sign of judgment against a nation that has driven God out of its life, that has put money or idols ahead of God, and that specifically strikes a nation's financial realm, wipes out the, mm-hmm. the accounts of the nation. So what could this have to do with America? Yeah. You know, America isn't under a law to observe the Shemitah. However, as a sign of judgment and a pattern, that's where it, it, it comes in, and it's going to come in amazingly. First of all, we talked about the two shakings. You have, the, you have 9-11, and then you have the economic collapse of, of the economy. And when do they happen? The, the, the key in the Shemitahs is this seven-year cycle. And so here you have you have September 11th. It happens on 2001. When did the economic collapse happen? 2008. It's the second shaking is seven years from the first. When did the financial collapse happen? In September, seven years to the month of the first. When exactly? To the, it was the second week of September. It's seven years to the week of 9-11. And literally when America was observing the seventh anniversary of 9-11, the second calamity was being set in motion on Wall Street even that day. And it gets, it gets more exact. And, and eerie, because what was the greatest day of the collapse, this economic collapse, that we're still living in the shadow of, the Great mm-hmm. Recession? Mm-hmm. It was the end of September, the greatest stock market crash in American history ever. And when did, and actually that morning, they were going to ring the, they, ring, they rang the opening bell, but the opening bell refused to ring. They, even Wall Street took it as an omen. That day, it crashes over 700 points. And when did this greatest day in American history, the collapse, Happen. It happened on the biblical day of the Shemitah, the day that is a sign of judgment on a nation that has driven God out of its life, that has put money and idols ahead of him, and that specifically strikes the financial realm and literally exactly wipes the nation's financial accounts away, wipes out credit, wipes mm-hmm. out debt. So we got the stock markets wiped out. We have, you know, we have bankruptcies, foreclosures, the Great Recession. It's like one colossal Shemitah, mm-hmm. and it begins on the exact day, and it goes even d- more. You go back, go back seven years. It's a seven-year mystery. Go back seven years from that day now. And, and you go back seven years to the month of, of September. And not only do you find 9-11, you find another cataclysmic event. You find the other greatest stock market, Wall Street collapse in American history up to that day. It was the greatest crash. When does it happen? It happens on September 17th, 2001. And, but on the biblical calendar, it happens on the exact same day of the Shemitah the day appointed for the wiping away of a nation's financial account, the day of a sign of the nation that is turned away from God. And so it happens on the exact same day. So the two greatest crashes in American history up to those days, both each happen on the exact same biblical day, and on the day that happens to be the day that strikes the economy. And not only that, they happened seven years apart, that's the Shemitah, and not seven years to the biblical day. I mean, it's exact, even to the biblical hour. I mean, it happens at, as sundown is approaching, as Rosh Hashanah is getting ready to be, the trumpets are getting ready to sound each day. They happen the same exact hour. And not only that, I mean, it's, it's, it would be enough, but it's not only that. They, they're only one Elul 29, only one 29th day of Elul, can be the beginning of the Shemitah or the end of the Shemitah. And that happens only once every seven years. So when did the 2008 crash happen? On the exact once in seven years biblical Shemitah. And that means the one in 2001 happened on the exact one, the same way. And also kind of mind-boggling is that 
the first one in 2001 happened was caused by 9-11. So it means that even that is part of the mystery. And there's nobody on earth who could have put this thing together. I mean, because this right. represents every transaction, financial transaction in the world. It all happened on the exact day. And, and the thing is that even beyond that is, you know, the, the word Shemitah means the release. And again, it was supposed to be a good thing originally, but it also has another meaning. It can also mean the, the letting fall or the letting collapse. And in this sense, this was, the, this was God letting collapse the American economy. And not only that, but it's, it's like here is the, you know, we're watching it more and more the signs of the end of the American age. The American age, as we know it, with America reigning supreme over the nation, economically, militarily, all that, we're watching the beginning of the end. And what happened in 2008 was a trigger that has been a catalyst where we are watching the end or the collapse of the American era. And that goes back to one of the mysteries in the Harbinger, that, that if America or any nation, and especially as such a nation as America that was founded to follow God's ways, if it turns away from God's ways, there's no way that the blessings that God has given it will be sustained. They will disappear. So there's no accident that we're witnessing right now. We're hearing more and more talk about the end of the American age yeah. as we know it. There's uh, Barack Obama comes on the scene eventually, and, and he actually makes a similar statement uh, that's similar to what is uh, being stated in Isaiah 9:10. Yeah. And, and obviously yeah. he's an elected president at that time, and he says to the Congress, he's addressing all of Congress. We can just play. It's just a few seconds here. We will rebuild. We will recover. And the United States of America will emerge stronger than before. Yes. Yes. And I keep hearing this little uh, defiance in the voice yes. here. Yes, yes, Jan. Yeah, here, here's the thing. I mean, and of course, I mean, there's so much we we don't we, we can't cover everything. But this is a very important point. There is a biblical standard. There's a biblical principle. Most of us know. Most believers know it. And that is that a matter of judgment can only be established by two or three witnesses, and at least. And so. Here, even in the matter of a nation's judgment, we've seen in the first part, when we did this on the air, we, the first part of the yes. harbinger, mm -hmm. we saw the mystery of the vow and the utterance. Here we have the first witness on the very day after 9-11, the Senate Majority Leader, he, he proclaims the ancient vow from the Capitol, the, literally Capitol Hill. And it's identifying America as the nation under judgment, it's paralleling everything, all the harbingers, and paralleling it to ancient Israel in its last days. But then we've got a second witness. We have another American leader, and that is John Edwards, and he does it three days almost to the anniversary of, da of Tom Daschle's proclamation, and he does it, and he does the same thing. And he builds his whole speech around Isaiah 9:10. He doesn't know what he's doing, neither of them do, and he repeats the vow word for word. But now we have, now it says two or three witnesses. Could there be a third witness? The third witness is the President of the United States. And with him, we have not only not only is it a higher level, but not only do we have the first shaking, but we have the second shaking, because he's coming in, he comes into his office at the moment of the second shaking, or in the midst of it. And so he goes to Capitol Hill. It's his first speech, major speech ever as a president. It's before a joint session of Congress, and he comes to Capitol Hill, and he makes this speech, and basically what he's saying is another form of Isaiah 9:10. What he's saying is, he, he starts out by saying, hey, it's all collapsing, and all right, all right, the economy is, is going, all that, everybody's worried all that. And then he says, but, it's like the bricks have fallen, but, mm -hmm. but, and then he says, there is something I want every American to know. And, and, and this kind of parallels, whenever, you, whenever these things are going to be proclaimed, you get this kind of prelude to it, where they, where they say, okay, this is for every American. All this. So here the president says, this is for every American to hear, I want him to know this. And then he says, he says, we will rebuild, we will recover and the United States of America will emerge stronger than before. Well, we, we, we will rebuild is something you might say after a disaster. It's not a natural thing to say in an economic crisis. But we will rebuild is the same word, yeah. the central core of yeah. Israel's vow. It actually says, and then we will, we will recover. Those are by the, Tom Daschle's exact words on the day after 9-11 from Capitol Hill. And, and then he says, we're going to emerge stronger than before. Well, that's, that's Isaiah 9-10, the whole point. Yeah. You know, we are, the bricks have fallen, but we're going we're gonna to be stronger than before. And so, and not only that, if you just type an internet search engine, the day, the, the night, the, just before the president made the speech, and you all you did is typed in, we will rebuild, it would have led you to Isaiah 9:10 on the first page. I mean, vert, every search engine would have done that. Mm -hmm. But after the president speaks, as he's speaking, the president's, we will rebuild, starts pushing 
the ancient we will rebuild out. It starts replacing it on the internet. Okay. So all, I mean, you know, so we will rebuild. In fact, all around the world, when they make the headlines for the president's speech, the, the three words they choose are, we will rebuild all over the world, from New York Times to Al Jazeera. President vows, Obama vows, we will rebuild. And you, and you have the first witness, you know, he makes his, you know, dashel, does it from the Senate floor of the House, the Senate wing. The president does it from the other wing, from the House of Representatives, same hill and the other wing. These are like the two witnesses, mm-hmm. the two houses of America that establish anything. And so it all happens. And so, and you know, and of course the president doesn't know what he's doing either. He doesn't even know he's, he's paralleling anything, but he does it. So it's amazing that even that, even the president, it goes even to the White House. You know, you must have a, have kind of a sat on some of this information for a while. Obviously, you began to have some insight at the ground of, of 9-11, and uh, then the book didn't get published until very recently. Um, how many years was this kind of percolating in your mind and in your heart? Well, Jen, the first part was very, the first was just a general awareness, which was right after 9-11, mm-hmm. that, that this, this moment in Israel's history and I, in that section. The second moment or, or period was 2005, so that's when the harbingers started getting revealed, one, the nine harbingers, one after the other. And then, again, I shared it to, to Beth Israel, the congregation mm-hmm. I, I lead. It was, you know, immediately it was, this has got to go forth and all that. So I still didn't do anything with it, except I spoke at the Messiah Conference yes. once. And, you know, every time I did it, there was some form of it kind of wanting to get out, almost like it started becoming viral, that anybody who could get a bootleg tape, mm-hmm. they, they put on the internet or whatever. So, it, you know, but it, people kept saying, this thing has got to go out. And so that was 2005. And in 2005, I also spoke about Wall Street and spoke about the link to the financial like a financial fall. So then I think, I think, Jan, it was about maybe 2009 when I started to put it in book form. You know, so, and then as I'm writing it, no, actually, actually, no, probably 2008. Actually, as I'm writing it, as I start writing it, the economy collapses. Yes, and uh-huh. These are things that are from the harbinger as well. So then this, that came like, well, that was like the second wave of kind of revelations mm-hmm. of these mysteries. And I started getting that. And when I got that, I didn't wait as long. I, a, a number of months later, maybe, maybe half a year later, I began sharing at Beth Israel, you know, mm-hmm. but it still wasn't, the book wasn't finished. Then the, when the book, when I finished writing the book, I think that was maybe now 2009 or something, I or 2010, around that, I was led to rewrite it. Originally, I wrote it completely straight out, like, you know, the, the totally nonfiction, totally, you know, here's the revelation. As I finished it, I was led to rewrite it, and I actually was led to a scripture, which, which says, but a wise man makes knowledge attractive, that the point is to get this out as far as possible to not only the saved, but the unsaved, because they have to get saved, and, and it's, it's a wake-up call. And also that I knew that there was a lot of deep things in the Harbinger. You know, you've alluded to, we've alluded to that yes, a few times. Uh-huh. There's a lot of deep things, and I, I wanted to do it in a way that people could just pick up the book and hopefully not be able to put it down, you know, just, just to, to draw in so that it can be imparted before people are even thinking, oh, wow. Like, so that's when I put it in the form of a man who is a, it's, it's a vessel, you know, and that is a, it called the prophet or a mysterious figure, and then there's another man called Noriel who receives these nine seals, and in those nine seals are the, begin the nine mysteries of the Harbinger. So that's once I started writing like that, it really just really flowed off my fingers into the into the computer. That you know, as a pastor, I don't have a lot of time to work on things like this. But within three to four months, it was it was finished. Well, I thought it was quite fascinating that once this is your first book, and you were sitting in was it an airport or something, yeah. and you were sitting next yeah. to a guy. Tell that story. Okay, I was. <laughs> I was thinking, Lord, you want me to tell this because I don't know where everybody's at you know, who are listening to all that, but listen, it happened. I, I finished, you're right, Larry, I finished the book, and the week I finished the book, I had to say, what do I do? I've never written a book before, never done anything, you know, with a publisher, and, you know, uh, you know I'm known in the Messianic movement, but they wouldn't know me, and, you know, most books never get published, you know. So, you know, I had some advice, people saying, oh, you got to make yourself known, and do that, and I said, there's no way I'm promoting myself. So, if they, you know, so, so what happened was, at the end of that week, I was scheduled to fly to Dallas to speak at a conference, and I... I was I was at mid uh, flight. I mean, I'm in I'm in Charlotte Airport connecting flight. I'm waiting for the next flight, and actually, when I go to Dallas, somebody's waiting for me because they want to tell a, a famous book agent about it, and so I have to give words. So it's kind of like the last moment. I'm at, I'm in Charlotte, and I bow my head before the Lord, and, and I have my 
have a little Bible there, and I'm, I say, Lord, this is, this is your word. This is your message to go forth. You have to do it. Uh, I don't want it the ways of man. I don't want it. I'm not going to be promoting myself, and I don't want to do it any other way. I want It's got to be you who does it, and you go, if you want this thing to go forth to America. So I pray that prayer, and I open up my eyes, and there's a man sitting to my left. And the man sits to my left. He turns to me, and he starts talking to me. He, well, at first he says, what's the good word? I said, well, I said, God loves you. I start witnessing to him. And he says, uh, I know that. He says, what's the good word? And so I, I start talking. And then all of a sudden, he begins and, you know, listen, I don't know everybody who's listening, their doctrinal viewpoint, but the fact is, it happens. He turns to me, and he starts speaking things there's no way on earth he could have known. Mm. He starts saying, you are going to publish a book. God is doing it. God is going to do a big thing here now. It's going to change your life. It's going to change things. But he goes on and on and on. He never saw me before. Mm. I never saw him before. I, I'm writing it down, what he's saying. And it turns out that not only does he say that, but he just happened to have been brought into touch with frontline public, you know, or charisma publications, mm. one of the larger Christian publications. I didn't do a thing. A little while later, I get a phone call, and it's the president, it's Steve Strang of Charisma, uh, in Frontline Publication. He, he calls him and he says, I heard what happened at the airport. We heard about this thing called the Harbinger, and we're interested. Mm, yeah. That is how the Harbinger got published. That's everything that's happened with the Harbinger happened from that moment. And so, you know, whatever anybody's stand is, it happened, and God is able to do what, you know, he's able to work his way. And the interesting thing, I mean, to top that, interesting thing is in the book, for those who've read the book, is the the first encounter takes place on where this man sits down and this guy sitting to his left, who's this mysterious figure, who's this prophetic figure, and the prophetic figure turns to him, starts a conversation, then starts speaking prophetically that it's going to lead to the man writing a book that's going to go to the nation. So it's mm-hmm. almost like God recreated what happened in the book to get the book, you know, for the book to be published. So that is exactly before the Lord. That is exactly how and the only way the Harbinger got published. I never, I didn't go to one publisher. All I did was bow my head and close my eyes and pray at the Charlotte airport. Well, I'm an author, uh, Jonathan. I can appreciate a story like that. And I've had not quite that dramatic, but I've had some... I I would uh, confirm that that's probably what happens when you've got a book that God wants you to get out to the world. I think the agenda is to try to get this to a secular audience eventually. I mean, obviously, it's available for anybody right now. Isn't it targeting a Christian audience or am I mistaken there? It's it's really it's really both, mm-hmm. you know, because it's not assuming that the person reading has to be believe in anything. The person who's receiving this in the in the book, the figure called Noriel, who's getting these mysteries, he's not a believer at the beginning, and actually he's Jewish. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, you could tell mm-hmm. that as it goes on. So it's starting from someone who doesn't know who, who they can come from any viewpoint at all, and so that's why you know we're hearing we're hearing about people getting saved through it because it's presenting you know things that it doesn't matter if one's a believer or not. It's like, whoa, what's yes. this? You know, you know, because it's giving, you know, really evidence upon evidence of sign upon sign, and where the reaction has been pretty much like, whoa, you know, that is the point. It is for believer and is for unbeliever alike, and, you know, we are, we're hearing stories all over about people getting saved. All, we're hearing stories about people repenting, you know, too, uh, in the body, and people starting prayer for America and, and you know, and for revival. So it is It is absolutely for both. Listen, remember the Da Vinci Code, I mean, this horrible, you know, thing. And it was such a big success, you know, in the world. There was nothing to it. It was against God. Had nothing behind it historically. But people ate it up, you know. So the thing is that this is this is an anti thing. This is yeah. for God, you know. So yes, it is. It is for both. The first people who have received it is the body. I mean, it's yeah. spreading well, very fa- very fast. Yeah, because we're talking repentance. We're talking about trying to save America, turn America around. Prayer and fasting. We're talking like in terms like that. So that obviously that's going to catch Christians. Christian ears, but my understanding is that um, hopefully even some of the more secular talk show programs are going to start featuring this. Is that right? Yeah, there is. I mean, the thing, yeah, the thing with the Harbinger, it ends there, but it's leading the person to that place. So there are there are secular venues that are interested. It's of course very hard, you know, for any Christian thing or anything that yes, I understand. Has to do with God mm-hmm. to get on anything. So you know, I've just asked your listeners and, and, and you sure. guys, you know, just to keep give it in prayer for God's will to go forth in this because to go to 
to go to the next level, if to go to that level for the sake of the word going out, mm-hmm. it's going to be incredibly controversial. The, the things that you and I, Jance and, and Larry, we spoke about in some camps, and, and it's been very much, very minority and very much, but that any controversy is going to be nothing <laughs> compared mm-hmm. to what happens yes. for it to go to the secular realm. But the Lord will use controversy too, you know, and I know it's not, you know, the, the point isn't a popularity contest here. And also whenever there was a, a, any kind of prophetic word, and what I mean is a word that is for now that the Lord can be using as a warning, you know, we look at the Bible, the, you know, the, it wasn't popular. And I believe that may be all part of it, but we have to be, you know, faithful. The, the thing I keep getting again and again it, to me is, listen, if you don't sound the trumpet, their blood is on your head. Yeah, I understand. That's Ezekiel 33. But here's what I see happening, Jonathan, and we're in a political season. We're in an election yeah. season. And I see Americans, and, I, and, and I'm including conservatives, Christians, evangelicals, messianics, I'm seeing them, not all of them, but some of them, saying, or at least thinking, that politics will save a a new, uh, somebody else getting the presidency in the fall is all we need to save America. I'm hearing the Sean Hannity say things like that, and and not literally that, but you can hear that in their voice. If we could just change an administration and get in a conservative, we can save America. That they literally say. And politics won't save America. What would save America is something like you've written here. That's my well, point. Yeah, and, and Jen, I, I agree that the problem was political, then the answer can be political. The problem isn't political. That's right. So, you, know, you know, political is, is one of the symptoms of the real problem. The problem is spiritual. Mm-hmm. And so the thing is, and, and that's really, and it's interesting because, I mean, in the book there's something called the Isaiah 910 effect, and it's, it's what happened with Israel, and it really goes to this whole point. You know, Israel is saying, hey, we can solve our problem by building stronger and having mm-hmm. bigger defense and, right. you know, politically, all that. The point is that, no, it's like you're trying to, you're trying to kill a weed by by cutting off the stem or the leaves, you know, it's a spiritual problem, and that's what America tried to do. We said, well, we're going we're gonna to solve 9-11 by mm-hmm. politically, militarily, and what happened is it came back, that's right. you know, on our economy. It became a house of cards. So, yeah. so it's exactly what you said. I mean, a person who is in leadership who is, you know, who is going to support more biblical values is certainly a help, but... It, that that alone is not going to do it because if the course of the nation itself mm-hmm. is moving away from God, yeah. it doesn't matter what what laws you pass. It can make some. It can make an impact, but it cannot turn the nation around. Yeah. There has to be revival, mm-hmm. and that really that is what you said. That is the purpose and the point of the harbinger mm-hmm. as a wake up call. Right, Jonathan. Is there anything you want to close off with here in the uh, closing minutes? Well, just to say that, you know, ultimately, you know, the Harbinger is without question a biblical warning and, Mm -hmm. you know, many biblical mysteries and a wake-up call. The point of the wake-up call isn't the idea to scare. You know, the point is to wake up, and it's like an alarm clock. And so, you know, if it was, uh, you know, this pleasant-sounding, you know, niceties, if nobody's going to wake up. And, you know, uh, a shofar call, you know, and that's really what it is, is not to be a, you know, a pleasing sound or a soothing sound. It's a wake-up call. So the point is ultimately hope, and because without yeah. that, there's no hope. Well, without waking up, there's no hope. Whether whether we're talking about America or whether we're talking about the church or whether we're talking about each of our lives, we have to, you know, it's a wake-up call. Time is short no matter what. And even if, if you know, the day comes whether we see, you know, whether we live to see all these things or not, we're all going to be standing before the Lord on the Day of Judgment. So we have to live in light of that. So the, the Harbinger is ultimately a book of hope and to salvation. The hope is, though, you know, it, it's even revival or anything. It is we who know God, we have to be the light we're supposed to be. We have to be the salt we're supposed to be. We have to put away whatever has to be put away in our life, and we have to take up whatever God has been calling us to take up. It's time for us to, you know, the Bible says, arise, shine. And the darkness gets darker, but the light has to get brighter. Mm -hmm. That is the word for now, and that is the word for such a time as this. Okay, don't go away, folks. I want to make some parting comments after I let Jonathan go. Just take, uh, we'll probably spend maybe five minutes wrapping up what you've heard here for 90 minutes. So stick around, please. As soon as I let Jonathan go, we're going to kind of summarize what you've heard. Jonathan Kahn, I thank you so much for giving up time today. Again, folks, you can find the book just about anywhere, any bookstore. You can visit theharbingerwebsite.com. You can visit hopeoftheworld.org, which is the ministry address for Jonathan Kahn. You can visit olivetreeviews.org, but at this point, we don't have the book. We may in the future. We don't as we speak, so you want to be careful about doing that. 
Jonathan, I'd love to stay in touch with you. Um, bless you, my dear friend. I, I just really, I've been very moved. As I said, I've done everything short of taking the book into the shower with me in the last four or five days. I just, <laughs> I've tried to saturate myself because, well, it, I mean, I just feel that I, I wanted to get the total flavor of yeah. the whole thing, the videos, everything, and, and to make sure that this yeah. is not some scheme of man, but that this has been a plan of God. And I do believe it is, but I do know there are naysayers out there, and I'm probably going to have to face some of them who will come come at me and say, why did you do this interview, Jan? Well, I know I'm supposed to do it, so yeah, God bless and, you. And, and the same same way, Jan, you know, same thing. I know I, I have to do I, it. And, I know and, you do. Yeah, and, and, and I don't have a choice, you know. And, exactly. And, Jan, I also want to say, I don't, you know, thank you. You know, I heard, I heard good things about you. And, uh -oh. But I also have, in our, in our time together, just have been really blessed with your heart. And, you know, it is totally for the Lord. And, and I'm just blessed by, by all this. And, yes, let's stay in touch. And, you know, you guys. And, Larry, thank you. Wonderful. And you'll be my heart in prayers. And You're just, welcome. Just, I just ask, just pray for God's will yeah. to be accomplished. Yeah. Jonathan, before you go, is there anything that our audience can do to pray for? For you, you've got to be right in the crosshairs of a lot of opposition or yes. criticism. Uh, how can we pray for you? Thank you. Yeah, if you can pray, well, uh, thank you so much. One is to pray for God's will, you know, with, with a harbinger that everything that he wants that it goes forth as he, as he wills to all who will hear. And secondly, yeah, pray for protection for, for myself and my family. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a, I have a, you know, a, a wife and a, a two year old and we're going to have a baby in okay. about a month. All right. Um, so just, just for that and, and also for God's strength, because we're, we're also getting, I mean, overwhelmingly, I do expect much more of the crosshairs, but mm -hmm. I, I, we are getting just overwhelmed with response from people and, mm -hmm. you know, all that, which is just beyond what we've been prepared for. So yes. even for time and even for, you know, for just rest with the Lord and those mm -hmm. things, too, as well. Okay. we Will do. Thank you so much. Thank you so all much, right. guys. And God bless you. Yeah, bye-bye now. Bye. Well, I have a lot of thoughts, Larry, after hearing Jonathan for 90 minutes, and I'm going to offer a couple thoughts here. We actually touched on this throughout the 90 minutes, and T.A. McMahon tapped into it as well, that our job is to save people out of hell, not to save America. That's really not the role of the church. Another thought I have is we can say that heaven, in fact, is our real home, not America. But you and I know that as people are listening, and under the circumstances, I would be one of them, we are grieved when we see what's happening to this great country. And I think it's only a natural human emotion when you're given the privilege of being born in such a great nation that we hate to see it uh, being dragged underneath the surf, so to speak. Well, for so many, many, many years, the United States of America has taken the lead in the world as far as getting the gospel out. So that's, that's the other part. We've seen that voice and that light dimmed and silenced. Jonathan, I think, has some very good points. And, you know, you can criticize any theologian, right? Look at Billy Graham, how many people have actually criticized him over the years for various things. But I think the bottom line, Jan, as far as God is concerned, the bottom line is God wants none to perish. He wants people to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, you know, the, the message of grace and mercy does it with some mm -hmm. folks, but with other folks, it's going to take a little harsher, a little bit more harder message like the harbinger that points to these unique situations, signs that God is behind everything. He's working this out for what purpose? Well, for people to take notice and come to salvation. And I think he was clear that God has no covenant with America. We are not any kind of a chosen nation. And I know some critics are saying, and, and there's some truth to this, aren't the warnings of the tribulation enough for America and the world to be warned? The Mosaic Law was made to Israel, and it separated Israel from the nations. And in the Bible, the nations are distinctly separated from Israel. And that's what causes some people to jump critically on this message that we've heard from him. And I just, and I think Jonathan understands that. I'm not sure that everyone who's on board with the Harbinger does understand that, that there's a distinct separation in the Bible. 
between the nations and Israel. Well, that is true. But I think, Jan, over the last uh, couple of decades, there has been a dumbing down in teaching. And many people don't even understand what the tribulation is. In fact, they, they just don't want to go there. They just totally ignore it. They stay in the social justice realm or how can they help their neighbor today. Fine with that. But they don't understand the theology that a lot of folks that have some maturity behind them understand. So I think Jonathan is taking a very practical look at an event, the 9-11, and has put some very distinct markers on it and said, this is what has happened, and, and it's just representative of the template of template. where... Yeah, it's a template, and he says that very clearly. So his critics really shouldn't be saying that he's trying to make America Israel. He's not. It's a template, as every preacher does, Jan, who goes to the Old Testament and says, here's the lessons we learn. It's a template from Israel to us today in the modern world. Right, and the turnaround that's going to happen and that would be heavily the spiritual turnaround, the, for lack of a better word, the revival that's going to happen. It, and it is going to happen, but it is in the tribulation. And again, as you say, the church is not equipping people to understand what this tribulation is all about. And I mean, the book of Revelation talks about multitudes too great to be numbered coming to faith during that tribulation period. So I think that is the great turn. That's the great revival. That's the great restoration is in spite of the carnage of the tribulation, it will be the end of the tribulation and the millennium when these things really do happen. But I I hear the passion in his voice, and that's because he feels he's called to be a watchman. He just doesn't want the blood on his hands. And Larry, that's one reason why this program exists. I don't want the blood on my hands for whatever topic it happens to be. Erwin Lutzer's message a week ago, whatever, I don't want the blood in my hands. Lutzer doesn't want it on his hands. Khan doesn't want it on his hands because we feel we have a message from God that we want to get to the people. Well, and that's why we appreciate Understanding the Times Radio and your listeners as well, Jan, because they know in their heart of hearts they're not hearing this message hardly anywhere today. It is an important message. To me, as a believer, and I've been a believer over 40 years, I want the whole story of God. I don't want part of it. Mm -hmm. And I think what we hear in the church today is part of it. And I tell people all the time who say, I don't read the book of Revelation because it scares me. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Nothing should scare us, Jan, because God is in control. That's the thing we have to always remember in the scripture. He is clearly in control. The book of Revelation is about judgment, but the one who is controlling it is God, not the devil. If the devil were in control of it, we'd be in big trouble. But God is in control of it, and his purpose is, like you say, is to bring those in the tribulation, hopefully to turn their hearts to him. Well, folks, the one thing I think that we do know is that um, politics, and I said this during the program, politics won't save America. The next election won't save America. Human government doesn't work. It just just never does. So even though, as we said in the program, that we want to get someone in that primary, the highest office in the whole wide world, who, who at least would look at some biblical principles a little more friendly than other administrations do. The point of the matter is that conservatism or libertarianism, these things aren't going to save America. It's spiritual issues that would hopefully save America, but I think that we also can say for sure that heaven is the real home for Christians, not America. And uh, the only thing I want to be careful when we say things like that is not to give fuel to people who say to us, you are so heavenly minded, you're absolutely no earthly good. But heaven is our future home. That is where we're headed. And and at some point in time, all the nations are going to be wiped out, every single one of them on the planet. Uh, We don't know the exact timing of that. Is the church here or not? I believe it isn't. But, you know, let's not argue about that timing, which everybody wants to do. So I think we have taken almost an hour and 45 minutes minutes to kind of at least offer to you a scenario that this gentleman has come up with. Is he right or wrong? Maybe it's somewhere in the middle, and we certainly don't know. But again, I do believe Jonathan's heart is sincere, and I understand his passion for being a watchman on the wall. And no one can argue that a nation such as America now, 15 trillion with a T, as in Tom, 15 trillion dollars in debt, that that is a problem, along with the moral problems, all the degrading issues 
issues that are going on in this once great country is not likely going to be turned around. Nonetheless, as I said a little earlier, may God bless America, but he only will if America blesses God. Thanks for listening, and we will talk to you next time. Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell brings you insights each week that will help you discern the times based upon a biblical worldview. Jan's guests are national speakers and commentators who are cutting edge as they inform us on issues in our world. Discerning the Times is a theme for every Christian so that you can be informed. You can listen to all of Jan's programs online, or you can become a CD subscriber and be mailed one CD a week of Jan's programs for only $15 a month. This way you can listen again to all of the programs and pass them along to your family and friends. Check out this information at our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. You can also write us at Olive Tree Ministries, P.O. Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Again, Olive Tree Ministries, P.O. Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Or you can call our office, 763-559-4444. Again, that's at 763-559-4444.